Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Dublin Economic Workshop Seminar. I'm Kieran Hancock, Business Editor of the Irish Times, and I'll be your moderator this morning. Our guest speaker is Minister for Finance, Pascal Donoghue. He's going to talk to us for about 15 or 20 minutes, after which you'll have the opportunity to ask some questions as part of a Q&A session. Uh, if you're like me, you're probably keen to know, for example, uh, when hairdressers will be allowed to reopen. So, uh, Minister, you might, uh, you might have to think about that for later. Uh, you can submit your questions via Zoom at the bottom of the screen where you see the Q&A link. Uh, just simply click on that and you'll be able to submit your questions. Uh, you might want to add your name as well. If you don't, that's fine. But just to let you know, there's about uh, just shy of 300 people who are uh, signed up for today's event. It'll and flow during the day, obviously, as people come in and, and go out. But um, we'll have about 300 people or thereabouts at some point or another. I should also remind you that this webinar is being live streamed and it's also being recorded. And before I hand over to the Minister, I just want to say a few words uh, to recap on his CV in politics. So he served in Dublin City Council from 2004 to 2007 when he joined uh, Shannon Aaron. He was first elected to the Dáil in 2011, topping the poll in Dublin Central, a constituency that he continues to represent. Uh, Pascal served as Minister for European Affairs from mid-2013 until July 2014 before being elevated to the Cabinet as Minister for Transport, Tourism and Sport. In May 2016, he was appointed as Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform, and he became Minister for Finance in June 2017, replacing Michael Noonan in that role. He was reappointed as Minister for Finance in the Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil Green Party Coalition in June of last year, and he was elected as President of the Eurogroup of Finance Ministers the following month. In spite of the many demands of politics, he still finds time to uh, contribute book reviews occasionally for the Irish Times. Uh, and the minister recently revealed uh, to the Irish Times that he's been listening to Bob Dylan, The Beatles, Mike Scott, Ham Sandwich and Beyonce uh, to help him through the pandemic. So again, maybe that's something we can touch on uh, later on in the uh, Q&A. But the theme of the speech for this morning is Europe, COVID-19 and the Euro, three key areas of interest, obviously, for the Irish economy. And with that, I'd like to hand over to the Minister for Finance, Pascal Dunham. Good morning, Kieran, and good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for the introduction and reference to the really important things like Bob Dylan, Beatles and the ham sandwich uh, that uh, I'm sure there'll be uh, many questions on later on in the morning. So uh, I want to begin as well by thanking the organisers of this event uh, and thanking the Dublin Economics Workshop for uh, scheduling this. I know particularly uh, that uh, I was due to do this in February and had to pull out some short notice. So I just want to thank Avrik and all the organizers for being so accommodating. Uh, this is unlike any other economics workshop I've done with you, uh, which is uh, very much the case with many different events that we're doing at the moment. Uh, I remember doing this event in Kenmare many, many years ago. I remember doing it more recently in other parts of our country, such as in Wexford. And today, of course, we're doing it all virtually. And while uh, these events have become the new norm and doing them virtually has become the new norm, we're all reminded of how much we miss in not being able to do them physically. And one of the reasons in particular, I miss those kind of physical engagements is it's difficult at times then to be able to anticipate the mood of the room. Uh, so I'm actually going to take keep my, my remarks uh, brief enough, and I look forward to all of the questions and comments from you in a moment. What I do want to do in these opening remarks is focus purely on my work as president of the Eurogroup, as the title of the event indicates, and update you on that work on developments that are underway in the Euro area with particular regard to where we stand with COVID-19. And I'll be doing all of this from my perspective as president of the Eurogroup, rather than just as a minister within the Eurogroup. I've been doing many of these kinds of events now in recent weeks and months uh, all across Europe. I did a similar event with the LSC, and then last Friday I did an event with the uh, Hertie School of Business in Berlin. What I will do is outline my insights to you at this point on Eurogroup, its role, my priorities as president of Eurogroup, and our response to date to COVID-19. The latter point would bring me to the statement that we issued this day last week 
and budget policy within the euro area. And I make a few remarks about that particular statement, as I hope it may be of particular interest to this audience. One of the principles of my presidency was building my work around effective and inclusive and transparent engagement in Eurogroup and with stakeholders outside of Eurogroup. And that's why I'm doing so many events like this and engaging with media all over Europe. And it's one of the reasons I place a particular value on doing this kind of engagement within Ireland. And it's great to begin the week with something like this. So to begin, I was elected president of the Eurogroup last July for a two and a half year mandate. What is the Eurogroup? Well, it's an informal body of Euro area finance ministers. Our main goal is to achieve consensus on economic policy through a focus on political and strategic discussions. It's very different to ECOFIN, which has a more legislative role. And of course, that's explicitly an EU 27 body. Our aim is to ensure the close coordination of economic policies across member states in the euro area so as to promote stronger and more resilient growth. These meetings, which take place at least once a month, require considerable preparation to ensure they're centered around relevant political discussions that create outputs that feature a high level of engagement from ministers and from informed experts and stakeholders. The sharing of experiences and perspectives plays a key role in engaging with ministers and allowing us to build up understanding and consensus in advance of the meetings. So the issues of communication and coordination are vital. Every single Eurogroup meeting is preceded by numerous calls to my ministerial colleagues and to their teams. This is how we get our work done. It is one of the means I use most to help understand the issues that ministers elsewhere in the Euro area are confronting. This regular communication also allows me to build the rapport and the dialogue that is vital to then lead to the negotiation that allows us to deliver political agreements. And from all of this engagement, it continues to strike me how similar the challenge is in COVID-19 across so many parts of the Euro area. We're all facing similar sets of problems, such as, for example, the future of our hospitality sector, and such as the, the design of economic supports, such as, for example, job retention schemes that are incredibly powerful tools of economic policy. Often, the only difference between us is one of timing. As president, I also engage actively with the EU institutions. This includes the ECB, the Commission, the ESM, and the Council. We also have regular so-called inter-institutional actor meetings, which is a mouthful. But in simple terms, this involves monthly meetings between the presidents of the Council, the Commission, the European Central Bank, and myself. And all of this feeds in to the work that we do before each Eurogroup meeting. Another key part of my role is to represent Eurogroup at the European Council. I presented to our leaders back in December and will do so again later this week on the international role of the Euro. I also attend G7 meetings, including last Friday, again, representing the Euro area. These are currently chaired by the United Kingdom. And just last week, 
we spoke on the common challenges created by COVID-19 and the nature of our global economic response back to it, with a particular focus on the challenges faced by very vulnerable economies. So I hope this whistle-stop tour of how we operate gives you a better insight into what the Eurogroup is and how it works and its role in economic and fiscal policy making. All of this is underpinned by a really detailed work plan that has five broad objectives. Economic and fiscal policies to support recovery and long-term growth, the use of banking union as a source of stability, capital markets union and in particular, the terms and aspects of that that are relevant to the euro area, the euro as a digital currency, and finally, the international role of the euro. I won't discuss all of these priorities today, as I want to focus on the very first item, policies that support recovery, given where we stand now. As an avid reader, I'm very much aware of the recent commentary and analysis of different fiscal responses across the world, including the European unions. There is no doubt that in particular, the United State plans are very ambitious and very large, and this is to be welcomed. However, I think it is important to estimate correctly what the Euro area and the broader European Union are doing. Here too, the response has also been extraordinary and in every sense. I've repeatedly highlighted the role the European Union has played in responding back to the economic challenge posed by this pandemic and the role of the Eurogroup within us. Just to recap some of this, last year, we built on the level of political momentum in response to economic conditions to set up the recovery and resilience facility. The original concept of this was agreed as part of the inclusive Eurogroup statement of the 9th of April of 2020. Eurogroup was also supportive of the activation of the General Escape Clause for the first time last March. This sent a really clear and early signal to the markets that this crisis and our response to it will be really different. Three critical key safety nets were also quickly agreed within the group as a direct counter to COVID-19 to the value of 540 billion euro the SHORE programme, the ESM's pandemic crisis support, and the European Investment Bank's Pan-European Guarantee Fund. These schemes are now fully operational and or available. And the success of SHORE in particular, in terms of member states accessing it, and also in respect of how oversubscribed its bond offerings were, speak volumes. More broadly, the centerpiece of the EU response to date has been the next generation EU and the RRF. These are momentous steps for the union to take. While just over a year ago, this crisis would have been unimaginable, I think these kind of responses would equally have been unimaginable. More broadly, the Eurogroup also agreed last November to ESM treaty reform and the early introduction of the backstop to the single resolution fund. All of these strengthen our crisis response mechanisms with the aim of protecting our citizens. Their tangible actions would benefit not only now, but also in the long term. And before I move on, I need to also recognize what national governments have done, as well as the role of our European Central Bank. There's simply no question that this time around, fiscal and monetary policy have worked hand in hand. This is something that wasn't always the case. All we have to do is look back at the last crisis. From the outset, the ECB has been decisive in their monetary policy actions, notably true, the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Programme. Their decisions have been vital 
in keeping yields low and in facilitating liquidity. They've helped to create the air of certainty at a time marked by uncertainty. This was again in evidence just two weeks ago with their most recent monetary policy decisions and communication. National governments have also stepped up and have taken unprecedented steps to protect income, lives and livelihoods. We've seen record levels of government borrowing to facilitate the operation of our automatic stabilizers and new and innovative discretionary income support schemes for individuals and businesses. And while estimates do vary, last year, close to 8% of gross domestic product was, was spent supporting our euro area economies, with an additional 19% of GDP in different kinds of liquidity support. All of these decisions have helped ensure that supports flow in an effective and an efficient manner. They are protecting literally millions of our citizens every day from the economic effects of this disease. Reflecting back on what has been done, speed, breadth and depth in Europe and in Ireland are the key qualities of these decisions. Economic policy has been bold, it's been agile and it has been effective. To highlight one economic metric, Okun's law, the relationship between output and employment. This hasn't held up in Europe, with job losses far less than might have been imagined, given the scale of the economic shock. And as I mentioned a moment ago, there has indeed been much analysis and debate on the respective sizes of different responses across the world. But let's make sure we don't miss a critical point. Let's make sure we don't deflect from the value of what each country is doing. Aside from the obvious differences between, for example, the United States and 19 Euro area countries, there are inherent differences in our economies, in our social protection systems, and in our longer term objectives. Ultimately, both economic blocks, for want of a better phrase, are injecting huge amounts of resources into battling COVID-19. These stimuli will naturally reinforce each other. Ironically, I spent part of St. Patrick's Day in discussion on this very issue with Secretary Yellen. We both firmly agreed on the value of what we are doing, the value of looking to coordinate this work, and we'll be engaging further on these issues through, for example, the G7. Before I conclude on this point, I'd like to give you an insight into how Eurogroup practically impacts on the fiscal policy of 19 member states based on our meeting last week and the statement issued in relation to budgetary policy. In these meetings, we have regular discussions on economic policy. And usually these debates occur at particular points in the year centered on the European semester for example, around budget time or mid-year following stability and convergence programs and the Commission spring package. However, last week's statement marked somewhat of a change. There was a feeling that we needed to reaffirm our economic messaging in respect of budgetary policy coordination, not just for this year, but also in terms of 2022 so that member states could prepare budgets and amendments to their budgets that continue the vital economic supports to citizens and businesses. This culminated in the statement which we issued on Monday evening on which there was absolute consensus. There are a number of elements to it, but the key takeaway is unanimity on the need for a supportive economic policy in the euro area. In simple terms, we reaffirmed that there would be no premature withdrawal of what we are currently doing. While the wording was agreed across last weekend and into Monday, the statement was underpinned by 
our actions of the previous years. We'll issue further guidance later in the year as new data and information comes in. Over the summer, we'll take the economic policy conversation forward with a particular focus on next year. Today, our efforts have been effective, they have been agile. They will need to remain flexible to win the battle against this disease. In fact, this was at the heart of the second part of the statement, where we emphasized the need for budgetary policy in time to pivot towards more targeted supports. We also explicitly recognized the challenge posed by higher levels of indebtedness, an inevitable byproduct of the exceptional supports are present, and the need to address this in time through differentiated and sustainable medium-term strategies. We also stress the need for ambitious reforms and productive investment supported by the ORF. This is a unique opportunity for member states to deliver stronger, more sustainable and more inclusive growth through prioritizing the green and digital transitions. So to conclude, Kieran, there's no doubt as to how exceptionally seismic the shock has been. This has been a tremendous challenge to all of us. It still is. In fact, we face a virus that uses the same qualities that underpin the European Union to infect our interconnectedness, our interdependence, and our interconnectivity are used as a means of transmission. So there is an inherent symmetry in the challenge we now face. However, there's also a sense of symmetry in our response. Nobody expected a shattering global pandemic to develop with such speed. But through Eurogroup and beyond, we have the political processes and structures in place to support one another. This is a key difference. Europe is different and it has responded differently in many ways. We have achieved an unprecedented level of coordination over the past year. We have a clear goal of supporting citizens, businesses and countries at a time of great need. So I'll conclude with two quotes from both sides of the Atlantic, which I think is fitting given one of the themes of today. In the words of Schumann, Europe will not be made all at once or according to a single plan. It will be built through concrete achievements, which first create a de facto solidarity. And in the words of President Roosevelt, and in this case, Theodore, in any moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing, the next best thing is the wrong thing, and the worst thing you can do is nothing. Thank you. Minister, thank you very much for that. A, a very interesting insight into the challenges facing the Irish economy and the policy response uh, for the pandemic, which as you say, has, uh, has been unprecedented in terms of its uh, size and scale and the way it has battered economies right across the world. Um, just to remind uh, people who are tuning in that uh, you can ask a question of the Minister. Um, in the Zoom box, you'll see at the very bottom a Q&A tag. Um, just press on that and you'll be able to ask a question. If you want your name mentioned, um, pop your name in. If you just want to remain anonymous, that's fine too. Just let us know. Uh, I do have a few questions in already, Minister, so we might just kick off with a, a couple of them, if that's all right. Sure. One is from uh, somebody who doesn't want to be named, but it's from a UK-based investor and uh, asking if the Minister is surprised at how the Irish economy has performed over the past year and what he has learned about how the Irish economy responds to shocks and stimuli. Uh, so, um... I think the key things that have underpinned the Irish economy uh, directly relate back to the learnings that we had from the last crisis. One of the uh, bitter learnings we had from a decade ago is uh, the value of a broad tax base with particular regard to income tax, the care you need to take about credit, and the importance of 
having a diverse employment market. And while the last decade uh, have been and continue to be, you know, challenging for many different reasons uh, in terms of the experiences we had during that period, what is the case now is those things have underpinned a degree of growth within our economy and resilience in our national finances that will be of immense importance for rebuilding our economy. The degree to which personal and income tax receipts have even grown. The fact that we did not have such a level of credit within our economy that it ended up being a transmission mechanism to create a shock for all of the economy. And the fact that we had, for different reasons, had to shut down employment in particular sectors, but we had other sectors that could continue to function. All of these things have been of inordinate value for where we are now that have created a really solid foundation for what we need to do next. Now, just in conclusion, when I say that, Kieran, none of that is to diminish for a moment the difficulty that many are facing today. None of that is to take away or to, or to underestimate the challenge that lots and lots of people are facing who are either running businesses or who can't work in a business they used to live on. But I'm just making the case that a decade ago, three things swung against us to create such challenge. A decade later, our national finances being sensibly run before the crisis, particularly with regard to our tax base, with regard to income, the care we took with credit and rebuilding employment across many sectors have been essential for where we are now and will help us in the challenges that we have with other parts of our economy and those who want to get back to work. Um, and on a similar theme, if you like, again, it's an anonymous question. Uh, in terms of our debt to GDP ratio, does the Irish government have a maximum limit in mind or is it simply a case of limitless uh, indebtedness indefinitely? Is that the new fashion as, as part of this uh, so-called new monetary policy? Well, uh, the answer I'm going to give you uh, probably won't surprise you as somebody who's participated in debates on this now for many, many, many years. I mean, um, MMT, uh, the, the, and I talked about this in an event that I did in the ERSRI there a few weeks ago, like I acknowledge the policy paradigm in relation to deficits and debts has shifted. It shifted for two reasons. It shifted because the academic framework around these topics is also evolving. You look at the debates and work that people like Jason Furman, Oliver Blanchard, Larry Summers have all done. The academic framework has evolved versus where we were a decade ago. And the real life policy framework has also evolved because of the work now that the central banks are doing through their monetary policy interventions. But there is a bust to all of this. The monetary policy interventions from the central banks of the world will change when the health emergency changes. And the policy analysis that has taken place in our academic community in many ways is more suited to very large economies that have their own currency. We're very different here in Ireland. So all of that means, do I have a threshold in mind? I do. It's a comparative threshold regarding where other small open economies with particular levels of debt hold have and where we stand vis-a-vis -vis them. And we will get to a point that issues of indebtedness and deficit management become preeminent again. But for now, our priority is, in particular, how we can support the SME fabric of the Irish economy. Because through measures like the wage subsidy scheme and the COVID restriction support scheme, which have a huge impact on our deficit, uh, we need to keep those measures in place to protect jobs and protect income. But even if you were to be to decide we're going to close out down all those schemes tomorrow because we want to reduce our deficits, other things would then happen. 
that would take the deficit performance back up again and deteriorate, cause it to deteriorate again, because then in the way in which our domestic economy would respond back to those policy decisions. So it's a far more complex and nuanced uh, background to these decisions than it was a decade ago and really demanding. But we're gonna get the balance right here in Ireland. We've done it over the last year and there will come a point in which we need to shift gear again, but we're not at that point now. Minister, can I just ask you when you think the broad brush supports that we have in place now across the economy, when the, those might be, uh, when you might begin to withdraw those and move towards more targeted supports for maybe industries uh, like aviation or hospitality or the events sector that are clearly they're going to continue to be impacted um, for uh, uh, you know quite some time to come. Well, so firstly, because of the design of the schemes, because of the design of the employment wage subsidy scheme, and in particular, because of the design of the COVID restriction support scheme, or the CRIS scheme, the sectors that you've mentioned are already the largest beneficiaries of our general support schemes. So, for example, if you look at the COVID restriction support scheme, uh, which has already invested now over 330 million euro in our economy since last October. The largest benefit, the largest recipients of that scheme are some of the sectors that you just mentioned a moment ago. So the, the nexus between general schemes and sectoral schemes is less defined because of the way in which we design the general schemes in the first place. To deal with your question in, in, in timing, um, I can't give you a clear answer to that question at the moment, not because I have a date in my mind and I'm not sharing it with you. It's because if I did have that date, it would undermine the case that I've just given you for agility. So it's not so much do I have a date at which we need to begin to make the transition. It's two other factors. Factor number one is, when do we think we will be on a path to a sustainable reopening? And the balance between that and the death and deficit issues that you mentioned to me in your question a moment ago. And for example, last summer, Kieran, and last summer, my God, it feels a long, long time ago, but last summer, for quite a few weeks, we were on a path in which the number of people on the pandemic unemployment payment was coming down, the number of people on the employment wage subsidy schemes and the number of firms on the employment wage subsidy scheme was coming down as well, and the number of people at work within our economy was growing, and the number of people who were opening up our businesses in our economy was growing as well. So like, we, we can, we, we can get that balance right. But then as you recall, we hit September and we had to change those schemes again because of what happened with the pandemic. So for me, it's a set of indicators rather than a date. Uh, and then how we reconcile those indicators with the borrowing requirements of the economy. Of course, the difference between now and last summer is that we have the vaccination program that's being Absolutely. rolled out um, yep. and some people might want to ask you about that a little later on but i'm just wondering then just to um maybe pick you up on a point you made in um in, in your answer there when might we be on a path um towards a, a sustainable reopening all things being equal I, I understand there could be some bumps along the road there could be new variants and things we don't realize uh, right now but all things being equal when do you think we might be on a path to a sustainable reopening well the, you see, your question in the way you put it to me there underestimates some of the challenges that we have. Like a variant is more than a bump in the road. And it's one of the real lessons I've learned from coordinating our economic response back to the pandemic. All that being said, as you also in fairness said, Kieran, the game changer about where we are is two things. Firstly, the presence of a vaccination program. And secondly, the growing evidence that the vaccines work and really have an effect. Both of those things 
are actually profoundly important developments. So, um, you know, I absolutely hope and expect as we move through the year, we will have an economy that is more and more open. Uh, and I'm confident that that will happen. However, there are vital caveats to that. And the vital caveats to that are um, that which we open, we can keep it open because we keep community transmission down and also because of the impact of our vaccines. And while I'm confident we will get to a more open economy, I'm also equally realistic in recognizing the challenges that we have in getting there. And the next step in all of this, Kieran, will be, er will be next week when we'll have to make another set of decisions for the next few months regarding changes that we can make in our public health guidance. Uh, thanks, Minister. Um, a question from TJ Kelly. Um, sovereigns won't be in a position to bear increased bond yields, so unlikely to be inflationary policy pursued by governments. Therefore, are we in for long-term low interest rates? And perhaps this uh, this uh, sort of addresses a point that was made by the Tonish, and I think you've made it yourself uh, recently, that there are risks to the Irish uh, economy from rising interest rates and, and rising inflation. Yeah, no, and I mean, that the, the, the Tonish that was uh, absolutely... Uh, uh, correct in just in, in doing what he did there last week, where he just identified this as being a risk we have to plan for. And what is really important about where we are now is the degree of work which has already taken place to protect us and help us deal with that risk in all the work that the NTMA have done in the funding and refunding of our current level of debt. So what myself and the Tornishta have looked to argue in recent weeks is there is a risk there. And if we plan for that risk, we can manage it. But pretending that risk isn't there will create risks for us that ultimately could well have costs. That's our core point. Um, do I believe we are in uh, um, you know, uh, longer forever? Um, Again, you know, at this point, speaking with my president of Eurogroup hat on, I have to recognize the independence of the ECB and recognize the work they do in setting out monetary policy guidance and recognize the different roles that each of us play. Um, the guidance the ECB have given is up until next March. You, you saw there last week the guidance that the chairman of the Federal Reserve in the United States outlined, uh, Chairman Jay Powell when he talked about interest rates being uh, uh, you know, and yields for them looking to be at a low level uh, for a while longer. And I think what we can broadly expect is our central bank community will recognize the need to do what can be done to manage yields and to influence yields. They can't control them, but they can influence them while we are allowing employment and hopefully income to grow again. So where we are at the moment, we will not be here forever. We will not be here, I expect, for the long term. But I do expect that the central bank community will look to try to influence an accommodative monetary policy environment to support us in the fiscal decisions that are needed to help our economies to regrow again. And in particular, I think one issue that would become more important in 2021 and 2022 is clearly you can fine tune the targeting of budgetary policy in ways you can't do with monetary policy. And that's going to, I think, be an increasingly important issue in the next 12, 18 months. Uh, thanks for that. Um, a question from my colleague, Owen Burke Kennedy at the Irish Times. Uh, is the period of austerity inevitable in the wake of such large budget deficits? So, um, for, firstly, uh, if you look at the origins of the concept of austerity in political economy, so much of that is influenced by the aftermath of the crisis of a decade ago. But the crisis of this decade is a completely different one to one we had 
then. And as I love to argue with you in the first question you put to me, the foundations that we have for dealing with where we are now are completely different to where we were in dealing with our last great national difficulties. Uh, if you then look at what would be the cause of expenditure and taxation decisions and changes that would need to be made in the coming period, much of the deficit challenges that we will face will be dealt with by an economy being safely reopened and staying open, and then us changing the emergency levels of support of expenditure as we move out of an economic emergency. So actually, many of the really big figures that are driving our deficit performance at the moment are where we are with the employment wage subsidy scheme and the pandemic unemployment payment, and then where we are with exceptional levels of health expenditure. When the emergency abates and when we beat COVID and we will, an opening economy combined with changing those levels of emergency expenditure will deal with much of our deficit challenges. The gap will then depend on how permanently bigger we want the Irish state to be. And that gap will in turn be influenced by, do we want it to be a lot bigger than it is now? And if we want it to be a lot bigger, then we will have to decide how we pay for it. So do I believe there are things that are um, inevitable? Well, what is inevitable is the financial markets will change. What is inevitable is the emergency fiscal and monetary policy decisions that we are making now. The background to those decisions will change as the health emergency changes, which in turn will mean changes will happen in monetary and budgetary policy. But as to whether uh, they will be the harshness of where we were a decade ago, um, I believe if we made the right decisions at global level, we can avoid those harsh decisions. But it doesn't mean we can avoid any decisions at all. And that will be the next phase of work when we have led our economy out of this acute pandemic era. Are we looking at income tax increases? UK Chancellor Rishi Sunak has signalled that tax increases are going to be needed in the UK, hasn't he, um, to pay the final COVID bill, whatever that might amount to. I'm, I'm just wondering in terms of Ireland, in our case, will that mean higher income taxes or will you come at it from a different, from a different angle? But I mean, look at what Chancellor Sunak has done. Actually, what he has said is that they're not going to index tax bans to income growth and use that to generate additional resources. And, um, he's, and he's actually made that commitment to particular parts of the uh, income tax structure in the United Kingdom. And the additional tax increase that he has indicated, he's signaled for the future. Um, and that is his decision. And he's facing the same challenges that many of us are at the moment. Um, uh, uh, so that's what, they've, what they have are looking to do within the United Kingdom. From my point of view, I'll be coming at it uh, from a different angle. I go back to the point I made earlier on, that that which is likely to drive significant changes in taxation levels within the Irish economy is some of the decisions that we're going to make in the future. In addition to deciding, do we want to keep what we are doing now permanently available? that is probably going to be the bigger cause of where we are with taxation levels in the future. Uh, from my point of view, if when income starts to grow again, um, uh, I, want to I want to work in future budgets to allow workers to retain their share of their growing income. I think that's going to be really important in delivering not just the rebound for the Irish economy, but a recovery for the Irish economy. And then we're going to be putting in place the Commission on Taxation and Welfare, 
which will then advise government on other options in relation to our entire tax code. But Kieran, I have to kind of stress to you the sequencing of all of this. Mm -hmm. Like our first priority is we've half a million people on the pandemic unemployment payment. The priority is to get those people and get our Irish SMEs, get the, everybody, get those people back to work. And when we make progress on that, all of the other challenges that we might face in the future will be of a different scale. If we can't get those people back to work, then the challenges we face will be of a bigger scale. And that's why we're going to get them back to work. That's why, my, that's why when I wake up every day and I walk into this building every day, I know the causal link in my mind is restoring work, which is invaluable from a well-being and living standard and dignity point of view. It's so important that we address that and make progress on it. But that of itself is the vital economic project for then influencing all the other questions that you're raising with me. Sure. A couple of questions from um, our, our viewers, uh, just on related points, uh, if you like. So sometimes, Kieran, I wonder, would my answers be better if I actually looked at the Q&A chat, chat file <laughs> as it comes in? But I'm not sure that would add to my preparedness or diminish it. And I also wouldn't want to uh, uh, do you out of a job with this particular section. So I can see yeah, the Q&A, yeah. I can see the numbers are going up the longer you're, I go You're doing on. just fine. I'm not sure if that's good or bad. Yeah, sure. Um, so one from an anonymous, uh, it's coming anonymously. Uh, what was the thinking behind taxing PUP payments in 2021 when the 2020 tax was allowed to be deferred? And uh, I'll, I'll just give you this one because it speaks to the point about getting SMEs back uh, back up and running. Uh, it's from Keeman or Cayman Wall. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Are there any plans specifically for the tourism and hospitality uh, sectors in terms of supports? So in relation to the first one, Kieran, I mean, you'll recollect some of the difficulties I faced when uh, we weren't in a position to uh, deal with the taxation issues of the PUP and, T and the temporary wage subsidy scheme in real time. And your own paper, paper in particular did a lot of analysis about speculating what could be the kind of deferred tax liabilities that might catch up with taxpayers in the future. And uh, I said at the time, if we had the opportunity to deal with these things week by week, month by month, it would be far better than allowing difficulties to potentially build up in the future. And then that's what we did. I mean, it's one of these situations where if I didn't do it in real time, the bills would mount up in the future for individual taxpayers, which could create a greater difficulty for them in the future. But of course, then in dealing with it in real time, it also does create other challenges uh, for um, income levels for people who really need the PUP or the employment wage subsidy scheme. But the answer was, and what I think is the best thing to do, is to deal with it in real time, to allow it to be dealt with by tax credits, as opposed to a bill appearing at the end of the year. In relation to sectoral specific supports, I, do, I just go back to what we are doing at the moment. The largest recipients of the employment wage subsidy scheme of the COVID restriction support scheme are the sectors facing the greatest challenges. The reason why we have the 9% VAT rate, the reason why we are warehousing tax liabilities, the reason why we are, uh, we've waived commercial rates. All of those decisions are taken, are driven by a knowledge that they will benefit particular sectors the most. So those sectors are getting really high levels of support because they need us. They matter for our economy, but God knows they matter for our society as well at the moment. Yeah, sure. Um, Dermot O'Leary of Good Buddy Stockbrokers has a question for you. Ireland has been one of the key advocates of free trade and avoiding protectionism over recent years. Is the minister concerned that possible protectionist measures surrounding vaccine production may have uh, knock-on implications for the EU with some of its main trading partners, including the UK. And that's a very interesting point, is it? Because we're, we're in the middle of Brexit and they're still, we're, we're still trying to figure out what the full impact of Brexit will be on the Irish economy. And this fracture between the EU and the UK over, vaccination, over vaccines isn't helpful, is it? And the figures that came out from the Central Statistics Office there uh, towards the end of last week actually 
showed with a degree of clarity what is happening to trade flows. Uh, and we should be very careful not to extrapolate from a quarter what's going to happen across the medium term. But it did show the impact that, it that Brexit was having on the, on the early part of trade flows in 2021. Uh, to answer the question, would I be concerned, am, am I concerned about um, an, <clears throat> a potential escalation in the um, um, erosion of global trade flows? Yes, I would be, but I'm answering the question conditionally because I actually believe in the last few months, we've seen things happen that give me confidence or a bit about our ability to make the case for successful, mutually beneficial global trade. And there's three things that have happened. Number one, President Biden. Number two, within the European Union, more countries been willing to make the case for a trade that has more of a competitive dynamic to it. And Ireland is playing a role in that. And number three, even if you have a look at the you know, concepts that are being developed within the European Union, we are evolving from strategic autonomy to open strategic autonomy, which recognizes the value of global trade. And for example, if you look at the, <clears throat> the vaccine or the medical devices um, uh, uh, challenges that could yet happen, we were there a year ago in relation to PPE, in relation to ventilators at the most stressful of times. And what we learned at that point, which we are aware of now again, is the supply of drugs across the world requires um, the sharing of chemicals and ingredients that flows in many different directions anyway. So you may make a decision, and I hope, and you know, this is obviously what is under debate at the moment, that may deal with the supply of drugs or vaccines in one direction. But of course, before you even get to the point of the vaccine being available, there are lots of other trade flows that are happening lots of other directions that lead to the vaccines being created. And we're very, you know, Europe is aware of all of that, of that at the moment. Sure, I have a question from Ronan Lyons um, he, about banking union, which I think is a priority, one of the priorities of the Eurogroup. He's wondering how might the banking union be enhanced in a way that's more obvious to consumers, borrowers and households and it might be an opportunity maybe uh, for some comments on, on also banks exit from the market, which isn't helpful, I guess, in the context of competition. And maybe you could give us your thoughts on that as well, Minister. Well, we, we made a big step forward in banking union at the end of November with the agreement in relation to the single resolution fund and the operation of the European stability mechanism. And uh, the process for the next step forward is I have to make a presentation to the European Council in June on the status of banking union and how we make progress on the different pillars of banking union from EDIS to cross-border financial integration uh, uh, and all the two other pillars that are essential to the project overall. Uh, in terms of what elements of it will offer the most tangible signs of progress to consumers and citizens, it probably is in the area of how we can indicate even greater certainty in relation to deposit insurance in the future. And then it will be about greater levels of cross-border uh, financial integration and indeed competition. Uh, but the truth, Kieran, is that these are things that are more likely to develop and be of great benefit in the medium term rather than short term. And the departure of Ulster Bank from Ireland is a very, very serious development for the Irish banking sector. Um, and, you know, as we emerge from this pandemic and we debate where we are, we will have to debate about what it means that a company that was present in Ireland for over a century decided to leave. And we will at another point uh, need to analyze what were the ingredients in that decision and uh, what that means for policy in the future as well. Okay, thank you, Minister. We're coming towards the end. Just uh, maybe a couple more questions, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. One from Justin, uh, Justin McCarthy, uh, which comes back to the Brexit point. Uh, is the Minister concerned that the proposal by France to introduce a different allocation key 
in the distribution of funding under the Brexit Adjustment and Reserve Fund could impact on Ireland's 1 billion euro allocation? And should Irish farmers be concerned? So very Justin, much- I should say Justin is editor of the Irish Farmers Journal. Yes, indeed. And uh, 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 we're very much aware of that as a, a development. Uh, and uh, I have been um, engaging directly with the Commission on this matter myself, with Commissioner uh, uh, Ferranto, uh, who is the Commissioner with responsibility for uh, uh, cohesion funding, uh, and uh, also with uh, other members of the Commission. Uh, so uh, uh, we are working very, very hard to protect our share of that funding. And we're very much aware of what would be the consequences of a material change um, in Irish funding uh, from the Brexit Adjustment Reserve Fund. By the way, can I ask you, what's your, what's your view on how big the Irish state should be post-pandemic? Uh, my view is that it will need to be, um, we will need to develop our, well, actually, so, let me, re let me repackage that a little bit. I think the challenges and things we're going to have to respond back to as a state are not confined to the impact of a pandemic. As big as the pandemic is, and as huge as its effect is on our society, there are many other uh, developments underway that are less immediate, but very meaningful that we will have to also think about in the context of the development of the Irish state. And like a small example of this, and this is less um, uh, impactful for us, but if you have a look at the integrated review that the United Kingdom published there last week, there are many, many dimensions of that that talk about their development of their defense capabilities that are not, um, uh, part of the Irish national agenda due to our uh, status as a neutral country. But there are many things that they talk about in that, about science, about climate change, about artificial intelligence, about geopolitics, that are very relevant to Ireland. And we will have to think about that as well. So that leads on to my answer to your question. The Irish state will be, I believe, uh, will need to be more effective, and I think a bit bigger, than it is at the moment. So more effective. I think the uh, regulatory footprint of the Irish state and the role that our policies play in enabling and setting and influence certain forms of activity within our country, that will be an element that will need to grow and be more effective. So that could be a state that has a bigger footprint without necessarily being materially bigger from an expenditure point of view. That's area number one. And then area number two is, if you look at it from a public health point of view, um, the capacity that we need to have within our intensive care facilities and in, with inside our public health uh, functions, for example, in relation to our testing, in relation to our tracing capacities, I believe we will need to retain those in a post-pandemic environment. So they are the two areas in which the state will need to, need to be a bit bigger and or have a larger footprint without necessarily being bigger from an expenditure point of view. Uh, and. Uh, they are not driven, however, just by the pandemic. There are many other both opportunities and challenges, Kira, that we're going to have to go after uh, that will influence that terrain. Sure. Uh, Minister, maybe finally we could close by perhaps you could give us uh, some insight um, to the government's thinking around the reopening of the economy. The next staging post seems to be April 5th. Perhaps you could just give us some sense of where the government is, is thinking at the minute in terms of what, uh, what might happen next. Well, Kieran, I don't want to end on a note that would be uh, disappointing to you as a journalist or potentially frustrating to our audience. Uh, but we have engagement on that now that we're going to have to do during the week and into early next week through the COVID Cabinet Subcommittee 
and also through uh, then a full meeting of cabinet on this topic in the coming days. Um, our figures have significantly improved versus where they were from a community transmission point of view, from the challenges that our hospitals were facing um, and so many families were facing who were in our hospitals. But it's also the case that while the figures have stabilized, they're not stabilizing at the lower level than we would have hoped for. And we have seen some concerning trends in the last few days. And additionally, what we are now seeing happening is the situation from a health point of view in other parts of Europe is also now changing again. And Kieran, this is very similar to where we were last November. And um, what the Tisha Kontonishta said when we announced the current set of decisions is that the change is going to be gradual and cautious. That's what it's going to be. And I absolutely appreciate what this means for so many. Uh, but we, this equilibrium of protecting our health and opening up our economy, we have learned how challenging it is to deliver that equilibrium uh, and deliver that balance. And maintaining that balance will improve as our vaccination program rolls out in the second quarter and gets bigger and bigger in the second quarter. Um, uh, but the next set of decisions are going to be very careful, Carol. Okay, Mr. Unfortunately, time has caught up with us, but I, I want to thank you for your time this morning. You've been very generous with it, and you've given us many insights uh, on many different topics here this morning. It's been a good broad brush, I think. Um, I want to thank all of those who tuned in for uh, today's event, and I want to thank you for your answers. Uh, we got loads of questions. Unfortunately, I couldn't get around to them all. Uh, I chose a selection of them, so apologies to those uh, whose questions I didn't ask. Uh, Minister, I can only, uh, on behalf of everyone, wish you luck in your important work in the coming weeks and months as we uh, continue to tackle this uh, pandemic. And hopefully, I'm looking forward to the jab. Uh, I'm sure everybody else is. And hopefully we can get the Irish economy reopened in the not too distant future. Minister for Finance, Pascal Donoghue, thank you very much. And Kieran, if I could just thank you for the session. And uh, uh, I can see we have a lot of participants in it. And the longer it went on, the more questions came in. Um, just to acknowledge and thank everybody for all their efforts and looking after themselves, their health, and also for those in business life, for their businesses as well. Uh, we will get to a better place. Uh, and uh, I look forward to being back on this forum again with you later on in the year. And we can uh, look at these issues again in the context of a healthier island. Great. Okay. Thank you, Minister. And thank you, thank everyone, you very much, for tuning Sarah. in. That's it from us.